Shalom, shalom, and welcome to Treasured Inheritance Ministry. I'm Yosef Ben Avram, and I'm super excited today to present you part one of this three-part series that I've entitled Revelation chapter 12 and the Final Remnant. And today we're going to look at part one, and I urge you, brothers and sisters, please don't just listen to part one. Come back and listen to part two as well as part three. In part two, we will touch on who exactly is the man-child. And in part three, we will look at a better resurrection. What does that mean and why is it all tied up together? So we will be looking specifically at the life of Elijah in part one. In part two, we'll start at chapter 11 of Revelation and we will go all the way through to the last chapter of Revelation in the series. And we will do a verse by verse analysis so that we can better understand what this sign in Revelation chapter 12 is all about and why it is so important for this generation to understand this sign. And I, I'd like to say this off the bat from the very beginning. We need to understand that Yahweh's word is very, very clear that he will not share his mysteries with that which is profane. So we need to understand, brothers and sisters, that he's not going to share the mysteries of his word with that which is profane. That is why it's so important for us to correctly interpret the symbols and the signs in Scripture. And unfortunately today, because of replacement theology, many, many people have an incorrect understanding of the signs and symbols within Yahweh's word. And they are applying incorrect signs and symbols to things in the word so that they make it have meaning that doesn't actually exist. Meanings that don't really fit scripture. And that is why it's so important that we do this thematically that we look at scripture thematically from the beginning to the end and we look at all the signs and symbols and we interpret them correctly if we don't we will have an incorrect understanding of revelation chapter 12. so before we start let's pray Father Yahweh, we want to bless you and thank you today. Thank you, Father, that we can come together as brothers and sisters around the world. And Father, that we can dig into your word. And Father, that we can understand and listen to your heart. That we can receive from you, Father, what you are wanting to say to us in this present generation. And Father Yahweh, we thank you in the name of Yeshua for each and every person that has joined. I pray, Father, that they will have eyes to see and ears to hear. Father, that they will listen to your voice and that they will understand what you are wanting to say to them. Father Yahweh, I pray that you will remove any preconceived idea, any theology that is not of you in the name of Yeshua. We pray, Father, that those things will be gone. And Father, that every single person listening to this teaching will come and receive from you and you alone. That they will allow your Ruach, Father, to speak into their lives. And that they will take what has been presented here and examine it, study it out for themselves as good Bereans. And Father, ask you what it is that you are wanting to say to them now. Why is this message so important in this generation? Father Yahweh, we thank you, we honor you, and we bless you in the wonderful and powerful name of Yeshua Mashiach, we pray. Amen. So brothers and sisters, like I said, part one, we will be touching on Elijah. And I'd like to stress this point from the very beginning, that if you haven't listened to our two-part teaching on Elijah, the man and the message, that you do that, please. And also, if you haven't listened to the four-part teaching on Ezekiel, that you please go and listen to that too. This teaching, brothers and sisters, I don't like to say this, but it is going to be an advanced study. It is going to be a deep study and, and a long in-depth study of the book of Revelation from chapter 11, as I said, right up to until the end. And if you do not understand what has been spoken about in, in the Elijah teaching, as well as in the Ezekiel, much of what is presented here might not make sense. So if you go and you listen to those teachings, I promise you that you will get a clearer perspective and the message will make a lot more sense. So before we start, what I'd like to say too is that part one is going to be on Elijah. Elijah, the image of Yahweh, and we will touch on a little bit with regards to the woman. Now, brothers and sisters, like I said, there has been a lot of talk on the internet with regards to the 23rd of September sign and this great wonder in heaven that they relate to Revelation chapter 12. And I normally do not get involved in things on the internet Yet the truth of the matter is that one needs some clarity and it needs to be discussed. We need to discuss what is actually going on in Revelation chapter 12. It is important for us in this generation to understand who the woman is in Revelation chapter 12. You see, only once we truly put all the pieces together, that's when we'll fully understand the significance of this passage. Because this passage relates to the final remnant. Now, I do not confess to know everything. No, I certainly do not. 
Just like you, I believe that each one of us are searching for the truth. And my aim with this teaching is to share what I've come to learn and then to share it with you in the hope that together we can find more clarity. I believe that as brothers and sisters in the faith that we are to refine our thoughts through the Ruach in Messiah Yeshua so that we can have a clear perspective of the days to come and that we can understand what it is that Messiah Yeshua is trying to say to us. Now there are many teachers as I said on the internet that are saying that the 23rd of September that the celestial alignment is going to be the rapture of the church. Now let me say from the outset, and I don't mean to offend anybody, but I need to say this from the outset, I do not believe in that theory at all. I've never believed in a rapture. What I believe in is I believe in a harvest of the righteous. Those that conform to the image of Yeshua in the same manner that he did. And that what he did was death. Now, that's something that many people don't like to talk about. Many people want to get out of your quick ticket. They want to get out of jail quick ticket. And they don't like to hear that there might be some suffering involved. Many of the disciples died for their faith. And we're going to show as we go through this teaching why we see that the conforming to Yeshua's image is related to death. Now, as I said before, if we fail to correctly interpret the signs in Scripture, you and I will land up with a false eschatological view that is marred by man's theology and half-truth. And that's just a fact. And you know, as I listened to many of the teachers on this subject, one thing stood out to me. One of the things that stood out to me the most is that many of the theologians agree that there are three entities in the passage that are of vital importance. Let's take a look. The first one is the woman. They, we speak about the woman in relation to, many, many theologians speak to her in relation to Israel. And we're going to talk about whether that is true or whether it's false by looking at the full counsel of Scripture. The second entity in this passage is the dragon, the dragon that makes war with the remnant of the woman's seed. And then the third entity that has now gained a lot of, um, how do I say, a lot of interest is the man-child. The man-child that is caught up to be with Yahweh. He is caught up. And they use the word there, the Greek word, which is translated in English as rapture. Now, it's amazing to see, as I said, how many theologians have changed their view on who these three entities are over the years. And I believe now more than ever, many are closer to the truth, yet many still fail to understand who the man-child is. And the reason why they fail to understand this is because they are not understanding who the body of Messiah Yeshua is meant to be. You see, the question I like to ask you is this. Are we meant to be the church or are we meant to be united Israel? Are we meant to be messianics or are we meant to be the one new man in Messiah Yeshua? We have placed so many labels on upon ourselves, as I said before. In all the teachings, we have placed labels upon ourselves so that we feel that we belong somewhere. And like I said, many theologians have begin, begun to change their view on who the man-child is. You know, many lay claim to the fact that the woman represents Israel. Then the reason why they say this is because she has 12 stars at her head and is clothed with the sun and the moon at her feet. I really hope to show in this teaching that we can be seeing, but in reality we are missing the truth. Why? Because we are seeing through a theological filter that has been handed down from generation to generation. You see, brothers and sisters, Scripture always interprets Scripture if we're willing to look at it thematically. Now, in order for us to fully understand who the woman is, we need to understand the story of Elijah. And that's why I said, please go and listen to the full teaching on Elijah, the man and the message, part one, as well as part two. We need to understand that Elijah is the one who is the voice crying out in the wilderness for all Israel to do what? To repent and return to the covenant of Yahweh, to return to the way that Yahweh wants them to live. We also know that it's this woman that is found in Revelation chapter 12. She is about to give birth to this man-child. And the scriptures tell us that this is a great wonder, a wonder that has never ever been seen before. That alone should cause us to ask a few questions. It has never been seen before. Now I'm sure that we all agree from biblical interpretation that the dragon represents the devil himself, Hasatan, and that he is the one that is waiting to destroy this man-child when it's born. 
Yet the scripture tells us that he is caught up. This child is caught up. And this is, like I said, where many get the idea that he is raptured to the throne of Elohim. And that, that brings us to the last entity, and that is of the man-child. And many have said that this is Yeshua, to which I totally disagree. And others have said it's the church, to which I also disagree. And they state it has to be the church. Why? As the child is raptured to be with Elohim. And it appears that this happens prior to the 42 months of the anti-Messiah. And you know, we need to always keep the facts in the original format. If you've listened to the teachings that I've done over the last couple of weeks or months, you will, you'll know that from all the other teachings that we have spoken about, and specifically those that deals with the book of Revelation, that John does not write the time of the tribulation haphazard. He is so precise in showing us that there is a clear distinction between the time of the saints, which is 1,260 days. He writes it as 1,260 days, which equals what? Three and a half years. And then in Revelation 14, we read that the anti-Messiah is given a time of what? 42 months, which is another three and a half years. Let us not confuse this. Because if we confuse this and we, and we, and we look at it as 42-42, we are going to be totally wrong. We need to understand that they are both three and a half years, but he writes it as 1,260 days for a reason, because that is the time that is given to the saints. The 42 months is the time given to the anti-Messiah. Now, brothers and sisters, do I believe that September 23rd, something specific will happen? To be honest, I'm not sure that I like setting dates to things. What I feel is of more importance is to understand the message of the hour and what the sign means in light of the full message of biblical interpretation. You see, once we have done that, then we can draw parallels to the heavenly sign if need be. Now, before we continue, we need to understand a very important scripture that will help us understand how our king works and why the remnant is a very important body of believers during this time. You know, as the world looks to all kinds of signs and wonders, we need to understand that our king, brothers and sisters, has already determined the true signs. And he has already set them apart for his glory. If you have your Bible, and I'm going to urge you, bring your Bible to these teachings, because we are going to go through so many different scriptures. And sometimes I, I don't always put every single one of them up on the screen. So please, if you have your Bible, turn with me to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 12 to 18. And it says the following, Do not say a conspiracy to everything of which this people says a conspiracy. And do not fear its fear, and do not dread sanctify Yahweh of hosts himself and let him be your fear and let him be your dread. And he shall be for a sanctuary and for a stone of stumbling and for a rock of falling to the two houses of Israel, for a trap and a snare to the ones living in Jerusalem. And many among them shall stumble and fall and be broken and be snared and be taken. Then he says in verse 16, bind up the testimony and seal the Torah among my disciples. And I will wait on Yahweh, who hides his face from the house of Jacob, and I will look for him. Behold, I and the children whom Yahweh has given to me are for what? Are for signs and wonders in Israel from Yahweh of hosts, who dwells in Mount Zion. Brothers and sisters, this is one of the most amazing passages of Scripture. Isaiah declares that they do not say a conspiracy to everything that people say a conspiracy. Isn't that exactly what is happening today? Everybody's jumping to every single sign and wonder. He further states that we are not to fear. And you know, the words of Isaiah ring clear for this generation today. To the faithful, these words should cause a stirring and a burning of a holy fire. Why? Because it's a declaration of how we are to live during trying times. He says that we are to sanctify Yahweh. We are to sanctify Him and only let Him be our holy fear. You see, when we do this, He will be a sanctuary for us. And He will become a stumbling stone to those who are not walking in Him. He will be a sanctuary to the faithful and to the righteous. Isn't that just awesome? You know, I cannot help to see the connection in verse 18 and the end of days. You know, in Daniel chapter 11, verse 35, it says the following. It says, some of the wise will stumble 
so that they may be refined, purified, and made spotless until the time of the end, for it will still come at the appointed time. Revelation 2 verse 10 also tells us, Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for ten days. Be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. Now verse 16, let's go back to it. In verse 16, he says the following, Bind up the testimony and seal the Torah among my disciples. And I get so excited when I read this verse because it's, it's, it's such a commission. And we've been speaking in the last couple of teachings about doing the works of faith, to do the works of Messiah Yeshua. And that is what Isaiah is saying. He's saying, bind up the Torah and make disciples. Go out there and do the great commission while these things are happening. Don't fear what is happening. Don't call everything a conspiracy and stop doing the works that you were called to do. But it's verse 18 that has really got my attention. Verse 18 has really got my attention. It says, I and the children Yahweh has given to me, these are signs. Verse 18 reads as follows. It says, Behold, I and the children whom Yahweh has given to me are for signs and wonders in Israel from Yahweh of hosts, who dwells in Mount Zion. You know, brothers and sisters, names in Scripture mean things. And you know, Zion surely was a sign to his generation of coming judgment and repentance. Yet there's so much more in this passage that we actually need to see. And I believe that verse 18 holds a great prophetic message to this generation of what was and what is still to come. You know, all of those that read the words of Isaiah and all of those that read the words of Isaiah after his death, right up to this present age, I believe have been left with a message, a true message of hope and deliverance. You see, we need to understand, as stated, that names mean things. Now let's have a look at what Isaiah and his children's names mean. Because he said, I and the children Yahweh has given to me are for signs. Isaiah's name means salvation of Yahweh and the names of his sons are as follow. The remnant shall return. They shall do it with speed and plunder. That's the second name, haste and spoil. You know, brothers and sisters, I believe that this passage holds a clear message of the days to come. In that Yeshua, who is Yah's salvation, and his sons and daughters of righteousness, the true remnant shall be the true sign in this generation. That is why in Romans it says that all creation in eager anticipation wait for the revealing of the sons and daughters of righteousness. You see, if we can get our mind around this, if we can grasp what is being said in this passage, then we will better understand the sign in Revelation chapter 12 and the days to come with such Clarity. Why? Because we will have the correct perspective. You know, what is interesting is that Ellicott's commentary states the following with regards to the children. Let me read it to you. It says, The children disappear from the scene and we know nothing of their after history. But all their life long, even with or without a special prophetic work, they must have been by virtue of their names witnesses to a later generation, to this generation of what Isaiah had predicted. You see, in Isaiah's own life, as including symbolic acts, as well as prophetic words, we have a further development of the thought that he was a sign and wonder. And the citation of the words, I and the children whom thou hast given me, is found in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 13. And what this commentator says is the following. He says, is noticeable yet chiefly as showing how little the writer of that epistle cared in this and other quotations for the original meaning of the words as determined by the context. He didn't care so much about the fact that it was pointing to Zion. Instead, the writer of the book of Hebrews, it was enough for him that the Messiah, like the prophet Isaiah, did not stand alone, but claimed a fellowship with with the children whom the Father had given him. John chapter 17 verse 6 tells us that. John chapter 17 verse 12 tells us that. And why? Because they are being alike servants and children of Yah that have been called to do what? His will. They have been called to do His will. Co-heirs with Him upon the earth. Isn't this passage just awesome? So the signs and the wonders shall be performed through the sons and daughters of righteousness and through Messiah Yeshua himself. That's what he's saying. 
And that's why this generation that we are alive in is such an important generation. You see, now more than ever, we truly need to understand this passage. That Yeshua and his faithful children, those who are walking in the inheritance covenant, that have matured as he has been asking them to, those sons and daughters that have stayed faithful to him, that have gone from milk to meat, that are no longer just mulling around in the outer court, but have progressed into an intimate relationship with him. They are the ones that the book of Revelation speaks about, that follow the Lamb wherever he goes. And they are the ones that will be used as a sign to this wicked generation. And not only to the wicked, but to also the seven assemblies of the book of Revelation. To those that are in the body of Messiah Yeshua, they need to wake up. Just like Isaiah was a sign to Israel in his generation. They, these faithful children, and Yeshua himself will be a sign that we are to look for. We are to look for these things. Not for all these other crazy signs and, and all these false prophecies. No, we are supposed to be looking for the true sign, the sign of Yeshua and his faithful remnant. Now, brothers and sisters, I have said this so many times, that the ministry of Elijah holds the key to interpreting the book of Revelation and understanding who the woman of Revelation 12 is. And I said it once and I'm going to say it again. I urge you, if you've not listened to the four-part teaching on Ezekiel, and the two-part teaching on Elijah, stop this teaching now and go and listen to that and come back. Come back and listen to this teaching at a later stage. Because most of what will be shown in this teaching is not going to make sense unless you place all the pieces together in Yahweh's word. I believe that Yahweh is wanting us to understand now more than ever how important it is that we are one with Him, echad with Him. That we are to conform to his image. Brothers and sisters, I cannot express this point enough. I did a teaching called Conforming to the Image of Messiah Yeshua. And it's everything that we need to understand. It is our destiny to conform to the image of Messiah Yeshua. We are to become like him. We are to walk in his ways. It's so important that we understand that. Because if we don't understand that, then we will not understand our purpose upon this earth. Now we need to understand that the ministry of Elijah is to call Israel back to the one true Elohim. And as I've said before, it takes some drastic measures. And we spoke about the ministry of Elijah in detail in that teaching. But in order for us to fully understand things, we need to recap on much what was said. In order for people who might just find this teaching offhand and have not listened to the Elijah teaching, I have to recap on a few points. And we will dig a little bit deeper and we will look at Elisha too. Brothers and sisters, I believe that the message of Elijah, whose name incidentally means my Elohim is Yahweh, is one of the most prophetic and important messages of this time that you and I are alive in. You see, the life of both Elijah and Elisha is of vital importance to our understanding of the events that will soon play out upon this earth. So let's take a look at the prophetic connections and similarities between his life and the calling and the work of the end time remnant the 144,000. You see, we need to understand that after the sin of Adam and Eve, and this is very important to understand. If you do not understand this, then you're not going to understand the woman in the book of Revelation. You see, we need to understand that after the sin of Adam and Eve, the Ruach has been in exile. She's the voice crying out in the wilderness for all Israel to return. That is why John was filled with the spirit of Elohim. He became that voice. He became the one that was filled with the Ruach. And you see, this can only happen how? How can all Israel return to the way that things were? It's only through the redemptive work of Messiah Yeshua. We need to understand that. We need to understand that the Ruach is the voice of calling wayward Israel back to the Torah and to the covenant of Yahweh that they've forsaken. And this is the message and commission of the end time remnant, the Elijah, the John, the Paul. They were all doing the same thing, the Samuel. They all those that are crying out for Israel to return to the covenant. This is so important to understand. And this is the message that prepares the way for the coming king. You see, those that proclaim this message they are the ones that will offer the right sacrifice to Yahweh from a contrite and pure heart. They are pure in heart. Furthermore, they know 
how not to profane themselves. Not only not how to profane themselves, but not how to, or, or or how not to profane the holy vessels, as well as the sacrifice and the sanctuary, and most important, Yahweh's holy name, his character. That's what we need to understand. Now we need to understand that the sins of Ephraim are still the sins among us today. And what are those sins? Rebellion needs to cease. Rebellion is like witchcraft, the Bible tells us. Rebellion needs to cease, and all those that confess Yeshua need to cease from their anti-Torah lifestyle. Because if you're anti, if you're anti-Torah, you're lawless. And Yahweh's word tells us clearly, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. We need to cease from our anti-Torah lifestyle and our profanities, as well as all kinds of defilements. You cannot come into Yahweh's presence with defilement. We cannot compromise on our faith anymore. You cannot say that you're for him, but then you're messing around. You see, the problem today is that we know all the right words and we know or think we know how to keep Torah. We do all the Torah tells us. We do the festivals. We keep Shabbat. The problem is that we can do all those things, yet our hearts are still divided. We still hang on to our idols of half-hearted worship. And because of the lack of hearing the voice, which is the Ruach, the great I Am, and hearing the voice of Messiah Yeshua, we the children of Elohim have become compromised in our faith. We've mixed our faith with so many things or we are lacking the fire that leads to a purified life. You see, we lack the holiness in our hearts that attracts the very presence of our King because our hearts are filled with other things. And because of our hearts, the presence of Abba cannot reside among us anymore. He cannot reside where there is defilement. He cannot reside where there is half-truth. You see, brothers and sisters, we know from the scriptures, just as I said with Adam and Eve, that sin separates the presence of Yahweh. It separates the presence of Yahweh from us. Because our sins, you see, our sins is what separates us. And where the sins are, Yahweh's presence cannot reside there. And what happens? Just like we read in the story of Samuel with Eli, Yahweh's Shekinah, Yahweh's presence, His manifest presence departs into the wilderness, outside the camp. And that is why it becomes the voice crying out in the wilderness. It becomes the voice crying out in the wilderness for man to repent and return to Yahweh. I hope you're beginning to understand this. You see, this then becomes the work of those with the anointing and mantle of Elijah. The anointing and the mantle of Elijah is the Ruach. These people that walk in the presence of Yahweh and walk in His ways, they become just like Elijah was, just like John was, just like Rav Shul was, just like all the disciples were, they become the voice crying out in the Ruach. They are the voice crying out in the power and, 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 and in the spirit of Yahweh to all Israel to return. They become the messengers of reconciliation. I hope you're understanding this. Now we have to address many things here before we can continue with our teaching. We need to understand that Elijah was calling all Israel back to Torah and to the covenant that they had forsaken. Furthermore, Elijah is not the only one who carried this anointing. There have been many that have done the same thing. Elisha continued it, so did Samuel and John, as well as all the disciples, as well as the final remnant and all those who walk in Yahweh's ways. You see, it's a call to restore that which is broken down. Why? Because of the sins of man. Because of the defilement in the camp. These people are like Pinchas. And I think that we've explained that pretty much in all the teachings that we have done. You see, this is the message of the remnant of Yahweh. This is the message of the true sons and daughters. They are willing to stand up for the righteousness of Yahweh so that His presence might dwell again in the camp. They become the protectors of Yahweh's presence. The priests were the protectors of Yahweh's presence. Brothers and sisters, in every generation there has been a remnant. A remnant that has been faithful and because of their faithfulness 
they have been used by Yahweh to do what? To carry a holy fire and to call out the wayward house of Israel in order that Israel might repent. And this is something we need to understand if we're going to be able to fit all the pieces together of this message. You see, the same message Elijah spoke is the same message Yeshua declared, as well as all the disciples. And that message was repent and choose today whom you will serve. That's the message. That we need to repent of our Torahlessness, that we need to repent of our sins and we need to choose today whom we will serve. Acts chapter 15 is all about that. You see, we are at that place again, brethren, where the presence of our Father is no longer among us because we have chosen the road of religion, compromise, and defilement. And we have not had a regard for Yahweh's covenant, the covenant that was given to us. Instead, we have allowed foreigners who are not circumcised to stand and teach us. We've allowed teachers that have not been called by Yahweh to teach us things that is in their own minds. And I need to say this next point and make it really clear. These are all the things that Yahweh hates, not dislikes, hates. And because of these things, he left the camp. He cannot reside where there is defilement. He cannot reside where there is lies, where there is half-truth. He has to leave. Yet let's be honest, many have no idea that he's even gone. They are happy to carry on in their sin and they have no idea that his presence has long departed. Because of a lack of spiritual discernment in the camp, we've allowed the defilement and Yahweh is not happy. Yet as stated in this time, brothers and sisters, he has a remnant. All through the scripture we read about a faithful remnant. A remnant that returns to build the walls of Jerusalem. A remnant that is in the time of the days of Rav Shul. A remnant in the days of Elijah. Just so today there is a remnant. A faithful remnant. You see, because of our lack of spiritual discernment in the camp, we have allowed the defilement. And like I said, Yahweh is not happy. He's not happy, brothers and sisters, at all with what's going on. You see, we need to understand why the call of Yeshua throughout his ministry and in the book of Revelation is what? It's the following. It says, blessed are those who have ears to hear and eyes to see. That is why I keep saying this message is not for everybody. This message is only for those who are seeking him in spirit and in truth, that have the eyes to see and the ears to hear. To have eyes to see means that you're walking by the Ruach. It's the Ruach that calls out those in the dispersion to return to Yahweh. And this can only happen through the redemptive work of Messiah Yeshua. He is the sacrifice that every single person needs to accept. It's those that truly have ears to hear and those that obey the message, I believe they will be the ones that will be used by Yeshua in this final generation to proclaim the redemptive work of Yeshua and the message of reconciliation to those that are still trapped in their Torahlessness. Now we've already taught that those that mature and go from children to sons are those that are spoken of in the congregation of Philadelphia. They are the ones that get the open door and they are the ones doing a great work in these final days. And if you haven't listened to those teachings, I urge you again to go and listen to them so that you understand what this open door is. All through the ministry of Rav Shul, he kept on saying that an open door has been given to me to go and proclaim the gospel. And that's exactly what is happening with this congregation. The faithful congregation has been given an open door, a time period. 1,260 days is the time period to go and proclaim this message with a great fire. So that the world may know who the one true Elohim is. The scriptures tell us that those that hold fast till Yeshua returns, those that overcome by keeping the works of Yeshua, by doing His works, they will receive power over the nations. Take note of that. It says that they will receive power over the nations and that they will inherit Yeshua. We don't inherit a church building. We don't inherit a ministry. We inherit Messiah Yeshua. Ezekiel chapter 44 tells us that. We inherit with Him and He inherits with us. What an awesome picture. You see, those that keep their garments, what does garments represent in the word? Our flesh. 
our garments. Those that keep their garments unspotted will walk with Yeshua in white. Which means what? We will walk with Him in a glorified state. Furthermore, those that overcome will be made pillars in the temple of Yahweh and will never go out. And Yeshua will write upon them the name of Yahweh and the city of Yahweh and Yeshua's name. We have spoken in a previous teaching what it means to be a pillar in the temple. Before there was the designation of priests and apostles and prophets, they were called the pillars of Yahweh's temple. That is why it is spoken about in the book of Revelation where it says that they shall be pillars in my sanctuary. They shall serve in my inner chambers. It's talking about priests. I hope that you're starting to get a clearer perspective. We have to dig into this to understand. If we don't understand this, we will not understand who the woman is. We will also not understand who the man child is. And we will not understand our duty and our calling. You see, the duty of this end time remnant is to prepare the way for the coming king and to prepare the people to be ready, to be ready to stand in the presence of Yahweh. It's this remnant that teach the people the difference between the holy and the profane and they help them to mature. That is why we have spoken all the time about the fivefold ministry, that the duty of this fivefold ministry is to what? To help people come to spiritual maturity, to mature in him. They know how not to profane themselves. They know how not to profane the holy vessels, the sacrifice, and the sanctuary. Now what needs to be seen from the scriptures is that the Elijah commission of Revelation matches the list of doctrines listed in the book of Hebrews that leads to our perfection. Let's take a look at what it says in Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 1. Therefore, having left the word of the beginning of the Messiah, let us go on to perfection, spiritual maturity. That's what that word means. Not laying again the foundation of repentance. Don't keep going backwards. Let's move forward. Move away from your dead works and begin to do the works of Messiah Yeshua and of the belief towards Elohim and the teaching of immersions. Once you have done those things, let's move on. Let's go away from just the laying on of hands and of the resurrection of the dead and of the everlasting judgment. And this we shall do if Elohim indeed permits. Like I said, Ephraim, Ephraim has rebelled against Torah. This is just the facts. You see, all need to cease from the abominations and defilements. And unfortunately the t today, this applies to those within the Torah community too. We cannot deny the fact that we have not walked in the way that our Father has wanted us to walk. And I've said it in all the teachings. We have become a religious people and we are lacking the true fire of His Ruach. You know, the story of the prodigal son is the story of Ephraim that needs to return to the covenant of Yahweh and lead, he needs to learn to mature in Yeshua so as to do what? To inherit the land. You see, we need to understand that there are two, pardon me, that there are those who are allowed to enter and then there are those that are ready to enter. There are those that are allowed to enter and then there are those that are ready to enter. There is a difference between those that are holy and those that are profane. There is a difference between those that are clean and unclean, anointed and not anointed, fruitful and barren, alive, dead, filled with the Ruach and empty, awake in the spirit or fast asleep. Those that are hearing and those that are deaf. Those that are seeing and those that are blind. Those that are circumcised and those that are not, that are not circumcised. Those that are blessed and then those that are cursed. I've spoken many, many times in all the teachings about Ezekiel chapter 44. And the central theme of Ezekiel chapter 4 is that Israel has allowed those who are not holy, who are not circumcised, to come in and to profane the temple of Yahweh. And you know, brethren, this is the same problem that Elijah faced. It's the same problem you and I will face in these last days. Those that say that they are for Yahweh, yet they are in essence defiled. And Israel has not kept the covenant of Yahweh. And instead, they have set ministers in positions of power that is not of Yahweh, but it's of man. The body of Messiah Yeshua has placed men in positions of power. Men that Yahweh never ever wanted to be in those places. You see, because Israel went astray and they allowed uncircumcised people into the sanctuary, 
they will bear the iniquity. And we know that because of this, the presence of Yahweh departed from among them. And the truth is that Yahweh's glory, as I said, cannot reside where sin is. It's the Ruach that departs from them and then resides in the wilderness. It becomes the voice crying out in the wilderness. And this then becomes, and I'm saying this again so that you get it in, it becomes the work of those that carry the same anointing and mantle of Elijah. We also know from Ezekiel 44 that this role of protecting the house, the very presence of Yahweh changed and it now rests on the sons of Zadok. The sons of Zadok are those sons that remained faithful to David in a time of great trial. And we need to understand that David is a type of Yeshua. You see, the sons of Zadok are a type and foreshadow of the final remnant, the 144,000. We also need to take note that they are two sons, just as there are two witnesses. Brothers and sisters, I, I, I don't think these facts are refutable. You see, if we don't connect the pieces, as I stated, we will not understand the signs and what they mean in the days to come. Now that we've explained the work of Elijah in summary, we need to take a look at the story of the widow woman once again. And she holds the key to our understanding of the Revelation 12 woman and the great sign in heaven. So let us pick up the story in 1 Kings chapter 17 and verse 2. And it reads as follows. And the word of Yahweh came to him saying, Go away from here and turn eastward and hide by the wadi Kirith, which flows into the Jordan. And it shall be that you drink from the stream and I shall command the ravens to feed you there. And he went and did according to the word of Yahweh, for he went and dwelt by the wadi Kerith, which flows into the Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the stream. Now, brothers and sisters, if we are willing to open our eyes, then we'll see amazing prophetic pictures in the life of Elijah, as it relates to the work of the final remnant. You see, we see in 1 Kings chapter 17 that after Elijah confronts Ahab and tells him that no rain will come on the land, Yahweh then tells him to turn eastward and go into hiding. And I believe that just as Elijah had to stand up against Ahab, so the final remnant will stand up against the spirit of the age and declare the word of Yahweh to this final wicked generation. Yet it's during this time those that are the remnant, I believe, will be protected by Yahweh. As we have read in the, in, in the congregation of Philadelphia, it says that he, Yahweh, will protect them from the hour of trial. That's what he says. He doesn't say that he will take them away, but he says that he will protect them during the hour of trial. Just like Goshen, I believe that Yahweh will protect his people, his righteous, faithful servants. We see in this the words of Yeshua to the congregation of Philadelphia, which we have already come to see in the congregation of the faithful ones who have what? They have the open door and the key of David. And if you haven't listened to the four-part teaching on the covenants, please also go and listen to that so that you can understand what the key of David is all about and why this congregation is actually walking in the third covenant, that of the inheritance. Now in Revelation chapter 3 verse 10, it says, Because you have guarded my word of endurance, I shall guard you from the hour of trial. There's the scripture. The hour of trial which shall come upon all the world to try those who dwell on the earth. And what's interesting is that John, who is in the spirit of Elijah, was also protected in a time of great trial by Herod while he was in prison. The similarities are awesome to see. In Mark chapter 6, verse 17, it says the following, For Herodias himself had sent and seized Yohanan and bound him in prison because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. For Yohanan had said to Herodias, It is not right for you to have your brother's wife. So Herodias held a grudge against him and wished to kill him, but was unable. For Herodias feared Yohanan, knowing that he was a righteous, a tzaddik, and set-apart man, and he protected him. And when he heard him, he was much perplexed, yet heard him gladly. Now let's carry on in 1 Kings chapter 17 verse 7. It says the following. And it came to be after a while that the stream dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Then the word of Yahweh came to him saying, Rise up and go to Zapareth, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. See, I have commanded a widow there to sustain you. Now, it's interesting that Yahweh had Elijah go to Zapirith, and it's, it's interesting for the following reasons. 
because it was a town in the land of Sidon, which happened to be the home of Jezebel. And we know Jezebel is kind of like um, Elijah's arch enemy throughout the story in the book of Kings. She's the pagan queen who was married to King Ahab. 1 Kings chapter 6 verse 31 tells us, Both Jezebel and Herodias, brothers and sisters, were types of the harlot. Now please take note of this, because as we get into part 2, and we look at the woman of Revelation 12, and we look at the harlot, it is very important to understand. You see, both Jezebel and Herodias, they are types of the harlot who rides the beast in Revelation chapter 17. Now the name Zephyroth is also interesting. Literally, it means smelting place. Or refinery. Figuratively, the place where the end time Elijah will be protected from Satan will be a place of refining of the saints, I believe with all my heart. It will be a place where Yahweh will seal them and where he will commission them in order for them to be able to prophesy against the beast. Now, let's look at some more of the story that's found in the book of Kings. Let's look. Further on in 1 Kings chapter 17 and verse 9 onwards. So it says the following. It says, Commanded a widow woman, a widow there to sustain you. I have commanded a woman there to sustain you. And he rose up and went to Zapperth and came to the gate of the city and saw a woman there gathering sticks. And he called and said to her, Please bring me a little water in a vessel to drink. And as she was going to get it, he called and said to her, Please bring me a piece of bread in your hand. And she said, As Yahweh your Elohim lives, I do not have bread, only a handful of flour in a bin, and a little oil in a jar. And see, I am gathering a couple of sticks. In another another translation it says, I am gathering two sticks, and shall go in and prepare it for myself and my son, and we shall eat it and die. And Elijah, Elijah said to her, Do not fear, go and do as you have said, but make me a small cake from it first, and bring it to me. And afterwards make some for yourself and your son. For this Yahweh Elohim of Israel, for this said Yahweh Elohim of Israel, the bin and the flour shall not be used up, nor the jar of oil run dry, until the day Yahweh sends rain upon the earth. Now, let's first establish who the woman is and why she is so important in the story. We know that she has a son and that she has only a little flour and oil left to feed both herself and him. Elijah then comes and asks her to make some food. And notice he first asks for some water. And the story goes on to tell the readers that the woman was gathering some sticks. And in verse 12, as I said, specifically says that she was gathering two sticks. This cannot be denied. We need to take note that it doesn't just say, hey, a whole lot of sticks. It says two sticks. And she's gathering these sticks so that she can make a final loaf of bread. Because in her mind, This bread is the bread of death for his son as well as herself because they desired to eat of this bread and afterwards to die of hunger. But Elijah says to her, bring me what I asked you so that I can make the bread so that you can go and feed your son and yourself. He then also says to her that neither the oil nor the bread will run up until Yahweh sends the latter rain. Now, (laughs) all I can say is, wow. Isn't this passage amazing in symbolism and truth? So let us take a look at who the woman is. Firstly, we need to understand this and we need to carry these thoughts all the way through into part two of this teaching as well as part three. You see, the woman is the Ruach for she is the one who gathers the two sticks, the house of Judah and the house of Ephraim. We see the same picture in the book of Ezekiel chapter 37, that it is the breath, the Ruach, that causes the bones to come together so that all Israel can stand as one new man. You see, she is the voice crying out to all Israel, so as to gather both houses of Israel into that one new man. However, in our story above, the woman is tired and she desires to die. And the question that we need to ask ourselves is why? Could it be that it's because Israel as a collective has rejected her and disowned her? You see, she has a little flower and the flower represents who? The Messiah. And she has oil, which represents the Ruach, the Spirit. And she has only these two things, the Messiah and the Spirit to do what? To offer Elijah. And he takes what she has and he makes himself a cake to eat and tells her to do the same. 
Yosa tells her that this barrel of flour and the oil will never run up until the time of the latter rain. In other words, it will not run out until the final outpouring of the Ruach on all Israel takes place. Until the final outpouring of Yahweh's Spirit on all Israel takes place. So the question then arises, who is the little boy? And I believe that the boy is Israel, for both the boy and the woman, his mother, are about to die. But Elijah reassures her that the time for death is not yet. So let's continue with the story of Elijah in Kings 1 Kings 17 verse 15. It says, So she went and did according to the word of Eliyahu, and she and he and her household ate for many days. The bin of flour was not used up, nor did the jar of oil run dry, according to the word of Yahweh, which he spoke by Eliyahu. And after these events it came to be that the son of the woman who owned the house became sick, and his sickness was very severe. There was no breath left in him. Now take note of that. There was no ruach left in him. And she said to Eliyahu, What have I to do with you, O man of Elohim? Have you come to me to bring my crookedness? Have you come to me to bring my crookedness? Pardon me, I lost my place. <laughs> it happens. Have you come to me to bring my crookedness to be remembered and to kill my son? So he took him from her arms and took him to the upper room where he was dwelling and laid him on his own bed and cried out to Yahweh and said, O Yahweh my Elohim, have you also brought evil on the widow with whom I am sojourning to kill her son? And he stretched himself out on the child three times, take note of that, and cried out to Yahweh and said, O Yahweh my Elohim, I pray let the life of this child come back to him. And Yahweh heard the voice of Elijah and the life of the child came back to him. And he and Eliyahu took the child and brought him down from the upper room into the house and gave him to his mother. And Eliyahu said, See, your son lives. And the woman said to Eliyahu, Now by this I know that you are man of Elohim and that the word of Yahweh in your mouth is truth. So again, we see the boy, the woman and Elijah and take note that the food did not run up. However, after some time, what happens? The boy falls terribly ill. And take note that the scripture says, as I said already, that he got so sick that finally no life was in him. No ruach was found in him. You see, brothers and sisters, we need to understand that the witnesses of Yahweh, all the patriarchs, matriarchs of the Tanakh, as well as the prophets and the disciples, as well as the end time two witnesses, they all proclaim the same message it's a message of repentance and returning to the covenant so that Yahweh may dwell among his people and this message is preached to all Israel so that he who's he the little boy so that Israel might be revived and filled with the Ruach once more so that the Torah can finally be written on his heart that's what it says in Jeremiah chapter 31 verse 33 for this is the covenant I shall make with the house of Israel after those days declares Yahweh I shall put my Torah in their inward parts and write it on their hearts and I shall be their Elohim and they shall be my people you see this was the message of Elijah John the Baptist as well as Paul and this will also be the message of the end time witnesses of Yahweh and this only takes place through the proclaiming of the true gospel message. Listen and, and take note of that because we're going to look at it in part two in more detail. What the true gospel message is. The true gospel message needs to be proclaimed. And the moving in the true spirit of Yahweh has to take place in his children. Now let's see if we can see more connections of this woman. You see, the woman of Elisha's story is also the Ruach HaKadosh. We had now Elijah, and now we're going to take a look at Elisha. I want you to notice the connections of this woman with the two sons with selling oil. If you have your Bible, let's turn to 2 Kings chapter 4 and verse 1, and let's read. It says, And a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha, saying, Your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that your servant feared Yahweh, and the lender has come to take my two sons to be his slaves. And Elisha said to her, What should I do for you? Inform me, what do you have in the house? And she said, Your female servant has none at all in the house except a pot of oil. 
And he said, go borrow vessels from everywhere, from all your neighbors, empty vessels. Do not get a few. And when you have come in, you shall shut the door behind you and your sons. Then pour it into all those vessels and set aside the filled ones. So she went from him and shut the door behind her sons who brought the vessels to her and she poured it out. And it became to be when the vessels were filled that she said to her son, bring me another vessel. But he said to her, there is not another vessel. And the oil ceased. So she went and informed the man of Elohim. And he said, go sell the oil and pay your debt. And you and your sons live on the rest. So now the question that we need to ask ourselves is what exactly is going on in this passage? You see, we see here the woman who again is a representation of the Ruach HaKadosh. She has two sons. The two sons are who? Ephraim and Judah. And the two sons are brought together in one house behind a closed door. And they are made one in the house when previously the creditor was going to do what? He was going to take them away. You see, brothers and sisters, the work of the Ruach HaKadosh is redemption and gathering into one, into one man, into one stick. And she remains alive by keeping her sons in the house with the door shut and by dispensing the oil to her neighbor's borrowed vessels. I believe it's so plain to see the message that is being conveyed in this passage of Scripture. Because this is the same as the two stretchings of Elisha upon the dead boy. Remember the woman is the Ruach HaKadosh. And the purpose of the story is the revival of life. And keep in mind that Elisha has the mantle of Elijah. And therefore he is in the image of Yahweh, which is Yeshua. They are image bearers of Messiah Yeshua. So the patterns of the story will follow the patterns of Yeshua's life. Also observe that Elisha is constrained to eat bread. And keep in mind the imagery of the bread of heaven needing to come in flesh to do what? To revive our dead flesh. See, brothers and sisters, this needed to happen. It had to happen. And it wasn't a joyful duty. Yeshua was constrained to do so. Let's have a look at 2 Kings chapter 4 and verse 8. And all the way to verse 44. And it came to be on the day that Elisha went to Shunem, where there was a prominent woman, and she urged him to eat some food. And it came to be as often as he passed by that he turned in there to eat some food. And she said to her husband, Look, I know that this is a set-apart man of Elohim, who passes by us continually. Please let us make a small upper room on the wall, and let us put a bed for him there, and a table, and a chair, and a lampstand. And it shall be whenever he comes to us, let him turn in there. And it came to be on a day that he came there, and he turned into the upper room and lay down there. And he said to Gehazi his servant, Call the Shunammite woman. So he called her, and he stood before him. And she stood before him. And he said to him, Please say to her, Look, you have gone to all this trouble for us. What is there to be done for you? Should I speak on your behalf to the sovereign or to the commander of the army? And she answered, I am dwelling among my own people. And he said, What then is to be done for her? And Gehazi answered, Well, she has no son, and her husband is old. And he said, Call her. So he called her, and he stood in the doorway. And he said, About this time next year, you shall embrace a son. Take note of these things. Please, people, take note of what has been said in this passage. And she said, No, my master, man of Elohim, do not lie to your female servant. And the woman conceived and bore a son when the appointed time had come, of which Elisha had spoken to her. And the child grew. And it came to be on a day that he went out to his father to the reapers. Take note of that. And he said to his father, My head, my head. And he said to a servant, Take him to his mother. So he took him and brought him to his mother, and he sat on her knees till noon and died. And she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of Elohim and shut the door on him and went out. And she called to her husband and said, Please send me one of the young men and one of the donkeys so that I hurry to the man of Elohim and return. And he said, Why are you going to him today? It is neither the new moon nor the Sabbath. And she said, It is well. And she saddled the donkey and said to her servant, Drive and go, do not slow down, except I speak to you. And she went and came to the man of Elohim at Mount Carmel, mountain. And it came to be when the man of Elohim saw her at a distance, that he said to his servant Gehazi, See the Shunammite woman, please run now to meet her and say to her, It is well with you? It is well with your husband? Is it well with the child? And she answered, 
it is well. And she came to the man of Elohim at the hill, and he caught, and she caught him by the feet. But Gehazi came near to push her away. But the man of Elohim said, Leave her alone, for her being is bitter in her, and Yahweh has hidden it from me, and has not revealed it to me. And she said, Did I ask for a son, my master? Did I not say, Do not deceive me? And he said to Gehazi, Gird up your loins, and take my staff in your hand, and go. When you meet anyone, do not greet him. And when anyone greets you, do not answer him. And you shall lay my staff on the face of the child. And the mother of the child said, As Yahweh lives and your being lives, I do not leave you. And he rose and followed her. And Gehazi went on ahead of them and laid the staff on the face of the child. But there was no voice and there was no hearing. So he went back to meet him and reported to him, saying, The child has not awakened. And Elisha came into the house and saw the child was dead, laying on the bed. And he went in and shut the door behind the two of them and prayed to Yahweh. And he went up and lay on the child. Now please take note of this. He lays on the child and he puts his mouth on his mouth and his eyes on his eyes and his hands on his hands and he stretched himself. He places his entire body on the child and the flesh of the child became warm and he returned and walked back and forth in the house. Then went up and stretched himself out on him and the child sneezed seven times and the child opened his eyes and he called Gehazi and said call the Shunammite so he called her and she came into him and said pick up your son then she went in and fell at his feet and bowed herself to the ground and picked up her son and went out and Elisha returned to Gilgal and the scarcity of food was in the land and the sons of the prophets were sitting before him and he said to his servant put on the large pot and cook stew for the sons of the prophets and one went out to the field to gather plants and found a wild vine and gathered wild cucumbers from it, filling the skirt of his garment and came and sliced them into the pot of stew, though they did not know what they were. And then in verse 40, it says, Then they served it to the man to eat, to the men to eat, pardon me. And it came to be as they were sitting the st or eating, pardon me again. I think my mouth is getting so dry from reading this long passage, but let's go through it. And it came to be as they were eating the stew that they cried out and said, O man of Elohim, there is death in the pot. Take note of that. A wild vine. And they say that in the pot is death. And they were unable to eat it. And he said, then bring some flour. Remember from the previous passage of scripture that we read what the flour represents? And he put it into the pot and said, serve it to the people and eat. And there was no evil matter in the pot. The evil is now gone. Now a man came from Baal Shalash and brought the man of Elohim bread of the first fruits. Wow. 20 loaves of barley bread and newly ripened grain in his knapsack. And he said, give it to the people to eat. And his servant said, What? Do I set this before 100 men? And he said, Give it to the people to eat. For this Yahweh, for, for this said Yahweh, eat and have some left over. And he set it before them, and they ate and had some left over, according to the word of Yahweh. Now I know that that was a really long passage to read, and I urge you to go and read it again and again and again so that you can see the prophetic pictures in this passage. And I believe some of you listening are already thinking, wow, but there's so much in this passage. So let's look at the items to notice in this, in this revival of the great woman. Firstly, what it says in the passage of Scripture is that this is a great woman. And I believe that this woman, again, she represents the Ruach HaKadosh. Just as the sign in Revelation chapter 12 is a great wonder, this is a great woman, a prominent woman. It also says that she constrains the image of Yahweh, who is Elijah. Remember that Elijah is in the image of Yahweh. She constrains him to eat bread. She states that she does not dwell with a king, but she dwells among her own people. If you remember, we spoke about the fact that the Ruach departed from the garden and she is no longer with the king. She is now among her own people. She is in exile. She is the voice crying out in the wilderness. I hope you can see this. She also says that she has no child, that she is barren. She has no child but she's barren. Just the same as Samuel's mother had no child, she was barren. Just the same as John's mother had no child, she was barren. So she's only given birth by the coming of what? By the coming of the image of Yahweh. By the coming of Elisha to her house. 
He goes on to tell us that when her son is grown at the time of reaping, and please take note of that word, at the time of reaping. As I said in the beginning of this teaching, I do not believe in a rapture. I believe in a harvest of the righteous. So when her son is grown at the time of the reaping, he dies due to an affliction related to his head. And I believe that this is an allusion to the fact that Elijah's head, remember Elijah knew, the, the, the Bible says that the sons of the prophets came to Elisha and said, do they know that his head, who was Elijah, his head, his master, will be lifted from him this day? I believe that's the allusion. Also, it's an allusion to John the Baptist. John the Baptist, who was in the image of Elijah, who was this, this Elijah, um, in the spirit of Elijah, he was beheaded. And I also believe, and, and if, you'll, if you'll see it, I also believe that this is an allusion to the final remnant's harvest, the harvest of the righteous at the time of the reaping of the first fruits. And the 144,000 are called the first fruits. And we see that in this entire passage of scripture. Let's go on. Now the woman who is a representation of the Ruach, she ascends and she lays the son, the man-child, on the bed of Elisha, and she shuts the door. She then runs to see Elisha, and she has a mountain experience which is the same as Moshe, Moshe and Elijah, and she falls down at Elisha's feet. She then tells Elisha's servant, everything is well. Remember after he asks all the questions, is it okay with your son? Is it, I mean, is, is it okay with, with um, your husband? Is it okay with your family? And then she touches Elisha's feet, and Elisha's servant tries to thrust her away, since he has touched what? She has touched dead flesh. Remember, her child has just died, and because she touched dead flesh, she is now unclean. And she touches Elisha, who is in the image of Yeshua. He's a, he's a type and foreshadow of who? The Messiah. So Elisha, who is a representation of the Messiah, he permits this woman to touch him and to make him temporarily unclean. Elisha knows none of what has happened to the son of the woman since Yahweh has hid it from him. He says, I do not know, and it has been hidden from him, totally hidden from him. Elisha sends his servant with his staff to lay it upon the face of the son, on the face of the man-child. And remember, Yeshua throughout the scripture is the staff. It is the staff that gives life. The Bible tells us that there is neither voice nor hearing from the child. When the servant lays the staff on the son's face, there is no voice and there is no hearing. It continues to tell us that the laying of the staff upon the face is done. And what happens? Just the same as Elijah in the previous passage, he lay upon the child. What happens in this passage? The laying of the staff upon the face is the passing of the image of the star. It is the passing of the image of Messiah Yeshua. This is very, very, very important. We need to remember the mountain experiences, that Yahweh is the voice and He's the key. He's the, the one that, that is sending forth His Ruach to call all together. Now, as we continue, the servant of the woman returns again to Elisha and tells him the child is not awake. It's then that Elisha goes to the house and he shuts the door of the house on them. He closes the door and it's just him and the child. I believe that it's here that both are made one behind the closed door. And life is bestowed and an awakening happens. You see, Elisha, who is in the image of Messiah Yeshua, he goes up and he puts his image. He lies on the child. And the child, who is a representation of who? Israel becomes warm, but is not yet alive. You see, we need to notice that he's doing this in person, whereas earlier he just sent his staff. And I believe that this is an illusion. It is an illusion to the marking of the 144,000. It is an illusion to the marking of the 144,000 with the name of Yahweh. First, they get marked by him. It is like the staff that gets sent forth. It is a marking upon the 144,000. They are marked by his name. Elisha goes back to the house and he walks around for a while and then he goes up. He ascends to the child again. The child sneezes seven times and opens his eyes. He's now able to see. Blessed is he who has eyes to see and ears to hear. Elisha then calls his servant and the woman and asks her to take up. To take up, in other words, to ascend. It's an elevation 
offering. We know that first fruits is a representation of what? Of an elevation. And the child goes out. Now notice the connection in what happens next. Elisha sets about to feed the sons of the prophets. And I told you, take note of what is going on here. And he, he, he decides that he's going to feed them through one pot. And he puts a wild vine. I believe that the wild vine is redeemed Ephraim, who is considered unclean by who? By Judah. And he puts his wild vine into the pot. And the sons of the prophets declare that there is death in the pot due to the wild vine. And Elisha makes it clean and edible by doing what? By putting bread meal. And we said in the previous passage that the bread meal is a representation of Yeshua and he pours it into the pot. As soon as all is made one in the pot and it's made edible by the bread meal by Yeshua, a servant brings the man of Yahweh the bread of the first fruits, 20 loaves of barley. And I believe that this is a representation of what? The two houses of Israel. So now the question that we need to ask is this. Is the son Israel or is the son in this passage of scripture the man child of Revelation chapter 12? You see, remember Yeshua who is the Elijah, he comes and he gives his image to the boy and the child becomes warm, but not seeing it or having an open mouth. He's not able to, to talk. It's only after Elisha's second coming that the son's eyes are opened and his mouth is opening. And what happens? He sneezes seven times. Brothers and sisters, we must also notice the end time context that it was the time of the reaping so the stretching out of these occurrences or the stretching out, it occurs. And, and, and I believe that, that this whole passage of scripture has a strictly end time fulfillment. You see, remember the two witnesses are resurrected and called up to heaven after what? Three and a half days. Just as Yeshua was resurrected after three and a half days. And I believe that at the time of the reaping, when he had the infliction on his head, is the time when the 144,000, the final remnant, the two witnesses will be reaped from the earth. They will be plucked out. And that's actually what the word rapture means. It means to be plucked out, forcefully taken out, pulled up. Ascending is another way of thinking of it. This is, rather than say, I, I can't explain I can't, I can't make this, how do I say? It's something that you're either going to understand from studying the scriptures or not. And I pray that you will have the eyes to see and the ears to hear. I know that it is an extensive, extensive um, information. There is so much information that has been given in just this one um, part of, of the teaching. Even for me, at times, it's difficult because sitting behind a computer and, and talking is, is sometimes difficult when you don't see people. And it's just giving information. And I pray in the name of Yeshua that you will have eyes to see and ears to hear, that you will truly understand what has been said here. So the stretching out upon the boy and the transferring of the image of Elisha, who is actually what? He's in the image of Yeshua. The stretching out and the transferring of the image to the dead boy, it happens twice. And the question I'd like to ask you is this. Could this be an allusion to the two groups at work at the end time? The two witnesses, which is the 144,000, that give their testimony, and then we see later, as we're going to look at, at chapter 12 of Revelation, we see the remnant of a seed that flees into the wilderness. You see, only one grows warm, while the other awakens, sees, and arises. Elisha has to come first. Elisha prepares the way for the coming king. And that's the message that has been found in this entire passage. You see, once you begin to see the prophetic connections, then the woman of Revelation 12 takes on a whole new meaning. Brothers and sisters, I'd like to present this to you. That the woman is not Israel. She is the Ruach. She is the one who is gathering all Israel. She is the widow woman in the story of Elisha. She is the woman in the story of Elisha. And that is why she is clothed with a son. You see, as we go on, I hope to prove this in more detail. I also believe that the dragon, as we said, is self-explanatory. And I feel how Satan has been called the dragon throughout the scripture and repeatedly in the book of Daniel and Revelation. So the question then remains, who is the man-child? And this is the question that many have been trying to answer for the past few years. And you know, now more than ever, we need to understand who the man-child is. You know, the prophecy of September 23rd lays claim to the man-child being the church who is raptured as a type of pre-tribulation rapture. 
But the truth is that the, that imagery, as I said before, it doesn't lend itself to such a scenario. You see, if you do not understand the 144,000 who are the true Israel from each tribe, and if you do not understand the two houses of Israel, you will not understand who the man-child is. I believe that the man-child is the remnant of the is the remnant and the 144,000. They are the two witnesses, the end time Elijah. Now, Yeshua said that Elisha would come first and then he would come. And I believe that is exactly what we see in Revelation. Elisha, the remnant, the 144,000 are all the same group. And Elisha or the 144,000, that final remnant, they do come first and then Yeshua returns. So let's see if we can pick up the truth in Revelation. In Revelation chapter 6, verse 9, it says the following. And when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the beings of those having been slain for the word of Elohim and for the witness which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Master, set apart and true until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And there was given to each one a white robe, and they were told that they should rest a little while longer until both of the number of their fellow servants and their brothers who would be killed as they were was completed. You see, yeah, you see the servants that are killed for their testimony of Yeshua and their blood is under the altar. The Bible says that the rest are not killed. Those that are not killed, they escape into the wilderness. And in the very next chapter, we have the sealing of the 144,000. Now, this is not happenstance. Let's follow the pattern. In Revelation chapter 7, verse 3, it says the following, saying, Do not harm the earth, nor the sea, nor the trees, until we have sealed the servants of our Elohim upon their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 sealed out of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Of the tribe of Yehuda, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Reuben, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Gad, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Asher, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Nephtali, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000 were sealed. And it goes on and on until we get to Benjamin. And every single one, it says 12,000 were sealed out of the 12 tribes of Israel. Brothers and sisters, I believe that these are the 144,000. That's what the scripture tells us. They are the servants of Yahweh, whereas the great multitude that cannot be numbered, they are redeemed out of the earth by the blood of the Lamb. And they receive the image of Yeshua. We need to notice the time difference. You see, John views the sealing of the 144,000. Then after this, he beholds the great multitude. In the book of Revelation, you will see the difference in location of the 144,000 and the great multitude. And I'd like you to see that. It says the following. And after this, I looked and saw a great crowd, which no one was able to count, out of all the nations and tribes and people and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, dressed in white robes and palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Deliverance belongs to our Elohim, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the messengers stood around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures and fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped Elohim, saying, Amen. The blessing and the esteem and the wisdom and the thanksgiving and the respect and the power and the might to our Elohim forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders responded, saying to me, Who are these dressed in white robes? And where did they come from? And I said to him, Master, you know. And he said to me, These are those coming out of the great distress, having washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Because of this, they are before the throne of Elohim, and they serve him day and night in his dwelling place. And he who sits on the throne shall spread his tent over them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall they strike, neither shall the sun strike them, nor any heat. Because the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne shall shepherd them and lead them to fountains of water of life. And Elohim shall wipe away every tear from their eyes. You see, this great multitude, they serve in Yahweh's temple and they are before the throne of Yahweh. But in Revelation chapter 14 verse 1, it says the following, And I looked and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion and with him a hundred and forty-four thousand having his father's name written on their foreheads. You see, there is a difference between the great multitude and the 144,000. The 144,000 stand on Mount Zion. They stand on Mount Zion with the Lamb. Let's look at what it says in Revelation chapter 21 and verse 9. It says, And one of the seven messengers who held the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came to me and spoke with me, saying, 
Come, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the set apart Jerusalem, the sending out of the heaven from Elohim, having the esteem of Elohim, and her light was like the most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear and crystal, and having a great and high wall, having twelve gates, and the gates twelve messengers, and names written on them, which are those of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel, three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the names of the twelve missionaries of the Lamb. And he who spoke with me had a golden measuring rod to measure the city and its gates and its wall. And the city lies four-cornered, and its length is as great as its breadth. And he measured the city with a rod, 2,200 kilometers. The length and the breadth, the height of it, are equal. And he measured its wall, 65 meters, according to the measure of a man, that is, of a messenger. Brothers and sisters, notice the dimensions of the city correspond to the 144,000. It's 12,000 times 12, or 12 times 12. You see, these 144,000, as we've been saying in all the teachings, they have an intimate relationship with the Lamb, and they share in His throne, in the inheritance. And this servant who measures the city, he appears to be the same servant who measures the temple in Revelation chapter 11. Let's see if we can see this. In Revelation chapter 9 and verse 5, let's read what it says. And a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our Elohim and all you servants and those who fear him, both small and great. And I heard as the voice of a great crowd and as the sound of many waters and as the sound of a mighty thunder saying, Hallelujah, for Yahweh Al Shaddai reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him praise for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife prepared herself. And to her it was given to be dressed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the set apart ones. And he said to me, Right, blessed are those who have been called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true words of Elohim. And I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, See, do not do it. I am your fellow servant and of your brothers who possess the witness of, Yah, of Yeshua. Worship Elohim. For the witness of Yeshua is the spirit of prophecy. Now it would appear that this angel, brothers and sisters, is a glorified fellow servant of Yeshua. Now before you say, how can you say that? I believe that from the measuring of the temple in Revelation chapter 11 to the outpouring of Yahweh's wrath in Revelation chapter 17 to the voice coming out of the throne in Revelation chapter 19 that they are all the same people. You see, this servant of Yahweh or this so-called angel, another word for angel is messenger, he measures the temple of Yahweh and all those who are within. And remember, like I said, another word for angel, you need to remember this, is messenger. In Revelation chapter 11 verse 1, it says, And there was given to me a reed like unto a rod. And the angel stood, saying, Rise, and measure the temple of Elohim, and the altar, and them that worship therein. You see, he only measures the temple and the altar, and those who worship inside of it, within the doors. And the size of the doors is six by seven. In Revelation 11 2, it says the following. It says, But the court which is without the temple leave out. And measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles and the holy city, and they shall tread under foot forty two months, the time of the anti Messiah. Go and read Revelation chapter fourteen and see that the time given to the anti Messiah is forty two months. So outside the doors, outside the area of six times seven is not measured. He's only measuring inside the most holy place. Brothers and sisters, it's here, and I think we have done this so many times in various teachings, it's here that we are seeing the battle for the door of Yahweh. Those who will be allowed to enter the most holy place, and those who will not. Those who have gone from the, from the covenant of the Abrahamic all the way into inheritance, they are the ones who are allowed into the holy place. And notice the door is the size of six by seven. And the conflict lasts six by seven. In Ezekiel chapter 41 verse 3 it says, Then went he inward and measured the post of the door, two cubits, and the door six cubits, and the breadth of the door seven cubits. So he measured the length thereof twenty cubits, and the breadth twenty cubits, before the temple. And he said unto me, This is the most holy place. In Revelation chapter 11 verse 3 it says, And I will give unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. 
So the length of the testimony of the two witnesses is for 1,260 days. Don't get it wrong. The testimony of the remnant lasts 1,260 days and the time of the anti-Messiah is written as 42 months. You see, these are two different time periods of three and a half years. These 144,000 brothers and sisters, they are the two witnesses. They are the two olive trees, the two houses of Israel, Ephraim and Judah. And they are the two menorahs standing before Yahweh as a light to the world. Revelation 11.4 says this, These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that are standing before the Elohim of all the earth. These are the two witnesses before Yahweh on earth that are dispensing the oil of the light of Yahweh, the Ruach. And they are calling the world to repent, to make Teshuvah and to return to the covenant of Yahweh. And they are calling the profane people back from the brink of destruction and showing them the way of holiness. Revelation 11 verse 5 says the following, And if anyone wishes to harm them, fire comes from their mouth and consumes their enemies. And if anyone wishes to harm them, he has to be killed in the same way. These possess authority to shut the heaven so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy. And they possess authority over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they wish. You see, brothers and sisters, so many times we look at the scriptures and we try to, to place interpretations are prominent that's not true this is the same power that elijah's ministry displayed elijah's ministry is to call israel to repent of their torahlessness and to show them how not to be profane these two witnesses which is the 144,000, they have the same power as elijah why because they have the mantle of elijah which is the ruach hakadesh the power of the ruach hakadesh will manifest itself for others to see this happened after Yeshua ascended into heaven and the Ruach descended upon the apostles and the Ruach filled all the house. It was then that the disciples received voice and they became witnesses unto the ends of the earth. Brothers and sisters, I pray that you're beginning to see the connections. In Revelation 1 verse 7 it says this, And when they have ended their witness, the beast coming out of the pit of the deep shall fight against them and overcome them and kill them. That's what it says. When the days of their testimony are done, the beast makes war with 144,000 who are the two witnesses and they are killed. Just as Satan must have thought his victory over Yeshua was complete when Yeshua died on the stake, I believe that the whole world at this time thinks that they are victorious over this end time nuisance, this group of people that are walking in the power and the presence of Yahweh, causing the world to feel that they are being condemned. Yet they are coming to cause people to return to Yahweh. But the world will hate them just as they hated Yeshua. They will hate them. I know that there has been a lot of information that has been presented in this teaching. At times it might have felt like it's all over the place, but that's the reason why it's done in a in a teaching like this, so that you can go back and listen over and over and over. As we get into part two, we're going to look at who the woman is and who the man-child is in deeper detail. And, and I, I really pray that you will join me for that. When we come back, we'll pick it up in Revelation 11 verse 8. And I pardon uh, my apologies, that scripture that I just read just now is not Revelation 1 verse 7, it's Revelation 11 verse 7. Um, there's a typo there, so... My apology for that. It's Revelation 11 verse 7. And when they have ended their witness, the beast coming up out of the pit of the deep shall fight against them and overcome them and kill them. That's what will happen. So when we come back, we will pick it up in Revelation 11 verse 8 and we'll draw connections to the sign of Revelation 12. And I, I really urge you, you don't want to miss that part. We are going to be identifying who the man-child is. It's of importance for us to understand in this generation. I pray that through the life of Elijah and Elisha, you're beginning to see the connections of who the woman really is. The woman in Revelation chapter 12 is not Israel. It is the Ruach. The Ruach is the one gathering. She's the one that has been sent out to gather the two houses of Israel so that they can become the one new man. The 144,000 are from each of the 12 tribes. They are a perfect representation of what the body of Messiah Yeshua is supposed to be. The renewed Israel in Him. But unfortunately, there is only a select group 
who get it first. As I showed you from the from the passage of scripture with Elisha, one will awaken and arise, the other will have to remain and becomes the remnant of the woman's seed that goes into the wilderness. I hope that you're beginning to understand this great, wonderful, powerful prophetic message in this generation. Let's pray. Father Yahweh, we bless you and we thank you today in the name of Yeshua Mashiach. Father, for your word, your word that is true, your word that is undefiled, your word, Father, that brings life to our dead spirits. I pray, Father, in the name of Yeshua, that your word will go forth. Father, that nothing presented in this teaching will be confusing to anybody. But, Father, those who have eyes to see and ears to hear, that this message will take root in them. And, Father, that it will bring forth a harvest, that it will bring forth joy, that it will bring forth understanding, that it will bring forth a change in their lives. And, Father, that they will desire, Father, to be part of your remnant, to be part, Father, of those that are willing to lay their lives down for your life, so that life may be lived through them and that life may be given to the nations. May they go and do the great commission in the power and the presence of Messiah Yeshua. Father Yahweh, we thank you and we bless you today that we are able to do this. And Father, I pray that you will give us strength in this final generation to overcome, to be of those that overcome, that inherit with you and that are able, Father, to walk in righteousness, in holiness and in truth. We bless you and we honor you. In Messiah Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. I thank you for joining me and I pray that you will join me for part two as well as part three as this is a message that needs to go forth in this generation. So again, thank you for joining me and I'll see you soon. Shalom.